Good evening, everyone. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. Uh, whether you are watching on Crowdcast or Facebook Live, we are glad that you could join us. And we're excited to be back after the winter break. So thanks for being here. Um, if you're new to one of our events, uh, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training and facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. So exactly a week ago today, as everybody knows, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were sworn into office. So it's week one of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, we have already seen a record number of women uh, nominated for the cabinet. Several have already been, of course, confirmed by the Senate including Janet Yellen as the first female Treasury Secretary. There's an all-female communications team and Biden has already taken action on several matters ranging from creating a White House Gender Policy Council to reviving the plan to put Harriet Tubman on a $20 bill. So, oh, and oh yeah, there's a female vice president who will be spending a lot of her time uh, breaking ties in the 50-50 Senate. So lots and lots to talk about uh, this evening and we are super excited to have with us CNN's newly announced White House correspondent, MJ Lee. Uh, MJ has spent the last year plus covering the Biden campaign. She spent the last two plus months back and forth to Delaware, <laughs> where she covered the transition. Uh, and just last week, CNN, of course, announced her as a key part of their White House team. So um, thank you, MJ, for being with us. And we want to let everybody else know, too, that we are um, going to be taking plenty of questions. So please um, feel free to drop those in the bottom of the screen uh, under the Ask the Question queue, and uh, we'll save some time uh, for that. And if you miss any of today's program, there will be a link for a replay available at the, the same um, site that you use to register. So welcome, NJ. How has your first uh, week on the new beat been? Uh, well, first of all, <laughs> Betsy, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is fun to be here. Um, especially at such an important time with so much uh, news going on and just yeah. a week into the new administration. Um, the first week as a White House correspondent has been interesting for a number of reasons, uh, most of them kind of personal. <laughs> uh, so for those of, who, of you who don't know this, um, I'm actually uh, based in New York City, so I'm not in Washington, D.C., and I've been a political correspondent at CNN based in New York the entire time, though, uh, you know, usually political correspondents uh, happen to be based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been here. Uh, it doesn't really matter when you're on the campaign trail because it just is a difference of what airport you're traveling out of. <laughs> um, so I've been here and uh, first covered the Elizabeth Warren campaign and then moved over to cover Biden uh, closer to the general election. And now that I'm covering the White House, uh, the move back to D.C. will eventually need to happen for myself and uh, my family, but that hasn't quite happened yet. So uh, the idea of sort of covering the White House from far away, uh, you know, I think under normal circumstances would be even more unusual and difficult. But we are in the middle of the pandemic and, you know, as it is, it, you know, it's pretty limited the number of reporters that we are sending into the White House, as you all know, uh, because of sort of the safety precautions that everyone is taking. So uh, it's both unusual, but, you know, we are in the middle of this COVID crisis. And so, you know, you have to sort of find ways to keep reporting without physically being in D.C. And, and that's been an interesting experience so far. But so far, so good. Good. So. Um, what is your just early assessment, um, since you will be part of that White House team, um, your impression of sort of the press relationship um, between the White House and the press corps? Um, obviously, sort of the days of maybe the fake news uh, is over from the White House podium. But what do you see generally in terms of um, the Biden administration's willingness for access and some transparency? Um, in this new administration just out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, contrast has been so stark even in these early, you know, first days. Mm -hmm. 
that relationship between, and I obviously didn't cover the last White House, but I did cover the Trump campaign, you know, was so uh, sort of fraught and uh, fake news just became uh, this phrase that so many people ended up using because it came directly from uh, the former president himself, right? And mm -hmm. uh, towards the end, uh, these press briefings uh, were not uh, even regular. And I think the fact that the Biden administration right out of the gate is sort of making sure that they are um, showing and trying to demonstrate that this is an important part of sort of the White House press corps and uh, White House comm shop relationship is making sure that they regularly have uh, White House press press briefings. Um, and also, you know, it hasn't been limited to the press briefings, but also uh, briefings of other kinds, right? The the biggest challenge that they face right now and the most immediate challenge is COVID. And so we, right. you know, saw today the first uh, COVID briefing that was led by the experts and the scientists who are on Biden's COVID team. So I think in all different kinds of ways, they're trying to signal for now that, you know, they want to be accessible. They at least want to create forums where reporters get the opportunity to regularly ask questions. And, you know, obviously, uh, I think that is a really good thing and encouraging. So what is your just um, before we get into a lot of the other topics around gender, I just, you know, sort of news of the of the week, if you will, um, wanted just to get your thoughts on where things stand um, with not only COVID relief, but sort of this vaccine distribution process um, that's going to be hopefully um, sped up here in the next few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing and the most notable thing is uh, how singularly focused the Biden White House has been uh, on COVID, just in terms of uh, the issues that they are talking about, um, the kinds of briefings that they are uh, holding, obviously the actions that uh, the president himself has taken already. Uh, I mean, the first sort of themed day, and, the, and this is what the Biden White House is uh, trying to do in these early days, is um, have days that are dedicated to a specific theme. Uh, today mm -hmm. was climate change, for example. You know, the first full day that he was in office was entirely dedicated to COVID. So I think um, the most notable thing is how much they are stressing that really there is no uh, other single issue that is more important and more urgent for them to deal with um, than COVID. You know, it's early. It has just been a week, but I do think, you know, we are about to transition pretty quickly from the beginning stages of, hey, we are we're new in town and we are just, you know, getting into the White House, getting settled. And particularly because transparency was such an issue with the former administration, you know, trying to get our um, heads around what exactly the situation is with uh, COVID vaccine distributions, you know, supplies, production, all of the above. Uh, and shifting to, well, how many days will it take for you to actually have a clear sense of where things stand and really being sort of demanded uh, to answer those important questions, right? I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I do think, especially if you listen to some of the questions that uh, they're getting asked by reporters in these settings, you are starting to see a little bit more of, well, why is it taking so long that you don't have answers to X, Y, and Z? And I think that's only going to get amplified as we get further into the administration. Yeah, that makes sense. So give us a sense, um, you know, we mentioned earlier, of course, the, the record number of women um, in this in very diverse Cabinet, give us a sense, uh, and Janet Yellen, of course, just being sworn in, um, about the prospects for uh, this cabinet all getting through uh, the confirmation process and what you see notable, I think there's so many different components of this, but what you see notable in sort of the rollout and uh, the folks coming into the cabinet, especially women, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think you can't stress enough how much it has been a priority for Biden and his closest advisors in the incoming uh, administration to have um, diversity reflected in these top roles. It's something he talked about a ton 
during the campaign. It's something mm-hmm. he really, really emphasized um, during the transition as well, you know, often saying the line, I am determined to have a cabinet and a government that really reflects and looks like the rest of America. And his, you know, key promise was that uh, his government will be, his cabinet at least, will be the most diverse that the country has ever seen. And, you know, so far based on the nominations and the appointments that we have seen, um, he is very much on track uh, to keep that promise. Obviously, uh, there are different kinds of diversity, but the gender diversity has been such a big uh, focus for him. You already mentioned, you know, even on a staff level, you know, it was a big deal when they announced that the comms team uh, leadership would be entirely female. Um, Someone like Janet Yellen, you know, becoming a first. Um, So there have been a lot of firsts in this administration already, and I think they are you know, very much on track to keep that core promise of there being diversity. You know, I think there are a lot of discussions to be had and, you know, we can have that discussion here on sort of what uh, what counts as sort of checking the box diversity versus what counts as diversity that I think matters to uh, people who are watching this closely you know, it's not just about uh, counting the number of women or counting the number of, you know, people of color in uh, these important roles. I think it's also about, well, what kinds of roles are they in? What kinds right. of, you know, what kinds of portfolios do uh, these people hold? Um, so I think it's a it's a complicated topic. And I think it is not just about making a list and, you know, checking off the names and counting uh, the number of people that sort of check the box as being uh, diverse. Well, and, and you alluded to this too, it is those definitely those those kind of positions, whereas, for example, you know, back to the Janet Yellen, traditionally not having seen women in some of the top economic policy roles. Um, right. In the Defense Department, a number of women now pointed to very high level, um, you know, undersecretary, deputy secretary jobs uh, in the Pentagon. Um, those two areas in particular, to me, kind of jump out as, you know, the areas that we really haven't seen a lot of women um, serving in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the more interesting things that really stood out to me during the transition process, and I'm not sharing anything that we haven't publicly reported, but um, you know, somebody who was seen as being just like a lock for a cabinet position was Michelle Flournoy. Right. Everybody you talk to in the earliest days, you know, if you ask them, you know, give me your predictions of who who is most likely to get which very prominent role. The DC, the DC parlor game, right, MJ? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, her, and her name, uh, um, yeah. as I'm sure you know, would come up probably the most frequently as this is a done deal. Nobody else is going to get this job. She is a lock for defense and everybody knows this. Uh, and then what ended up happening uh, was that uh, Tony Blinken ended up being nominated for Secretary of State. Uh, there mm-hmm. was talk, of course, about whether Susan Rice could end up getting that nomination. But remember, this was at a point where uh, the Georgia uh, Senate races had the runoff races had not happened. And so the power structure of the Senate was not yet clear. And so uh, what our reporting had shown at the time was that that ended up sort of triggering this uh, domino effect where Tony Blinken had gotten the Secretary of State nomination. Janet Yellen had been nominated for Treasury Secretary. And then you are sort of looking around and realizing, well, for at least the the big four uh, typical cabinet positions that people talk about, this sort of realization within the Biden world, well, we probably can't have all four of those people be uh, white. So, I mean, this is what I mean about, and of course, uh, Flournoy didn't end up end up getting that nomination. Yeah, uh, this is what I mean by sort of uh, like different kinds of diversity that we're talking about. I think it's yeah. the year 2021 and Michelle Flournoy being a woman in a sense sort of wasn't enough. Like there was such a push and the Biden team was feeling so much pressure to make sure that there was other kind of diversity that was being uh, reflected in these top roles. And so ultimately this person who was seen as being such a lock for this very important prominent job didn't end up getting it. And we know for a fact that diversity ended up being a really big factor. That's interesting. I mean, and you mentioned sort of the political pressure component that 
has gone on. Talk a little bit more about that sort of behind the scenes um, in this process. And, and you know, um, Biden's administration, you know, listening to various, I guess, interest groups might be the right word, um, to try to kind of formulate this, this cabinet and, you know, um, what sort of impact, I guess, do some of these groups have um, not only in the cabinet nomination process and, and staffing, but now thinking, you know, policy wise um, and prioritizing various pieces of policy as well, right? Right. Um, and I do think we should be, you know, very clear uh, to anybody watching that we are not talking about some new dynamic. This is not, you know, new to the Biden administration for, you know, every incoming White House and every incoming administration. Of course, like you are uh, always facing pressure from, you know, whether it's different interest groups or different demographic groups. Um, and, and frankly, people who uh, supported you during uh, the campaign. Right. And I think this is definitely definitely the case for uh, Joe Biden. This is a uh, you know, during his campaign, this is a man who, you know, at, at a certain point uh, during the primaries, people thought his campaign was over, his campaign was totally flailing. Uh, and then you get to South Carolina and it was uh, definitely with the help of uh, black voters that he was able to revive his campaign. I mean, he talks openly about that. His advisors talk openly mm -hmm. about that. And I do think there's a certain amount of making sure that the decisions that you make um, you know, once you're in office, sort of reflect the diversity of um, different people, different groups of people who supported you and helped you get there. I think obviously the sort of more cynical way of phrasing that is sort of paying your dues to the people who supported you and, uh, you know, helped you during the campaign. Uh, I think you know, they probably wouldn't put it that way. They would probably say like diversity matters uh, on its, you know, for its own sake, and we would be doing these things and being cognizant about diversity anyway. But yes, politics is at play. And I think different kinds of pressure that you get from different uh, kinds of people who have different interests, uh, that is always at play. And I think the Biden administration is, is no exception. Are there any positions, um, since we now have a 50-50 Senate and a, a majority leader, Schumer, um, are there any of the cabinet nominations that could be dicey? I know early on people were talking about Neera Tandon at OMB uh, potentially having issues, but are, is there, what are, you, what are you hearing from that? realm? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that was our uh, reporting during um, the earlier days, pre-inauguration that, yeah. uh, you know, the way that it was described to me was, um, by a Republican source was there's nobody on the list of uh, nominees that Biden had uh, who whose nomination is in more trouble uh, and and would have the most you know more difficulty than Neera Tandon for OMB. Um, yeah. Obviously, the dynamics have changed a lot, as you said, because the uh, makeup the of the Senate is now uh, clear, but. Uh, at least in the earlier days, her nomination was the one that uh, really seemed to upset Republicans and and some Democrats too. But mm -hmm. this was the one person who uh, you know folks seemed to say, yeah, we are okay with so many of the others that Biden is nominated, but uh, near Tandon, we are not you know not going to be okay with her. Well, we'll see how, I guess, see how that plays out. Um, you mentioned uh, the portfolio um, of some of the cabinet secretaries. And of course, I wanted to drill down a little bit on um, the vice president. Um, you know, obviously a historic uh, role that she is undertaking. Um, what is your sense just from, you know, having reported on her, uh, of course, during the election and transition and now, what do you see as kind of the major portfolio um, that she is going to have uh, in this administration and what it may mean for her politically down the line? Yeah, I mean, to be very honest with you, um, I do think it is too early. I don't know that even, you know, Kamala Harris's closest advisors mm -hmm. could tell you or could, you know, precisely predict right now this is going to be her portfolio. 
And, and, you know, I think the vice president herself has said as much in uh, some interview settings where she was asked, you know, what is what is exactly the role that you're going to play? And I think she's been pretty clear in uh, saying publicly the role that I'm going to play is to support uh, the president and whatever endeavors uh, he is undertaking. You know, obviously, it's an interesting dynamic because the president that she is working alongside is a former vice president. And, you know, Biden is somebody who talked a lot about um, that working relationship between himself and former President Barack Obama. And, right. when he, you know, when he was choosing his own VP, he really like wanted to emulate that because it was a working relationship that in many ways worked really well for him. So, you know, I, I do think that. Uh, this would be a more um, like I would have more insight and we would all probably have a little more insight into <laughs> what kind of, you know, VP Kamala Harris will be if we were having this discussion a couple of months from now. Um, but look, uh, since this is a lot about uh, gender dynamics, dynamics yeah. and gender and politics, I do think there's a really fascinating discussion about um, the decision to choose Kamala Harris and sort of the process that Biden and his advisors went through even in the earliest days um, in, you know, going back to announcing on that debate stage, I am going to choose a woman to be my partner. Right. You know, in, in some ways, I think people were not surprised uh, because it's it was very, very hard to imagine uh, someone in Biden's position, ultimately not choosing a woman, but it was a very sort of calculated decision early on to make that announcement and make that promise. And I I certainly do understand the, um, the argument from some people who heard that and heard it as, well, isn't that a little patronizing? Isn't that a little, you know, pandering? Shouldn't it be not about gender, but about the person who is most accomplished? And of course, Biden's response to that was, as well, I'm certain that there are many, many women who are, you know, extremely accomplished and ready to be president. And so I'm, you know, making the promise early on that the next vice president really should be a woman. And how much do you think the fact that he emerged as the nominee out of a field that included six women, how much of that do you think weighed on his mind in order to kind of make that promise um, to start off with? Um, I, I think that must have been a a, a huge uh, factor, yeah. Because it's it's what the country saw, right? Um, I, as I said before, uh, started the 2020 campaign by covering Elizabeth Warren, and she was not just the woman in the race, but she happened to be one of so many women uh, in the race, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, not just, um, uh, you know, she's over here and the men are over and the serious candidates are all male and they're over here. Like she was really in the mix as, you know, so so was Kamala Harris until her campaign uh, became uh, less successful. <laughs> uh, so I think the fact that this was such a historic race uh, for the Democrats with multiple very serious, very accomplished in their own rights, women candidates in the field, um, I think I think that was a, a really important and uh, sort of prominent factor in the decision from Biden mm -hmm. world to make sure that a woman was chosen. Another person with a big portfolio is going to be the first lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Um, mm -hmm. What do you all I know today there were reports that she's going to be a key part of this task force uh, uh, that Biden is planning on uh, announcing to um, aimed at reuniting children that were separated from their parents at the border um, right. under the Trump era policies. But what do you see, um, you know, in terms of, of her kind of um, in a role, obviously keeping some of her professional obligations as a teacher, um, this whole debate that we saw a few weeks ago over doctor being in front of her name. Um, what is your sense of, of her as a first lady and as, a, you know, part of a power structure in the White House? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as with so many things with the new administration, so much of this is going to be drawing that contrast between this administration and the prior administration. So, you know, I'm talking about the former first lady, Melania Trump, mm -hmm. and how uh, sort of unusually um, sort of private removed um, 
sort of out of the public uh, vision she was um, throughout the four years that Trump was at the White House. I think already we are seeing uh, that you know Jill Biden is going to be a very different kind of first lady and um, public figure. But that's not to say that that's so unusual. Um, I think it is just that when you compare her to the last and most recent first lady that we had, um, that is a real contrast. I, I am curious to see how she juggles the fact that she's going to, you know, continue teaching. She has said that that is important, right? Um, with whatever portfolio she, you know, ends up prioritizing at the White House. But also keep in mind, uh, she's the also the former uh, second lady of the country, right? She has been incredibly sort of involved in public life and you know, has had this experience for a number right. of years. So you would assume that the issues that she, you know, that were really important to her during the Obama years, you can't, you know, you can imagine that those issues have probably not changed very much for her. Right. And I'm sure she will have quite the waiting list right on her uh, classes <laughs> that she's yeah. going to be teaching, right? Well, I was thinking um, that for uh, Doug Emhoff, too. Don't you want to exactly. hear? Yeah. Well, and you know, school, you too, as, as the first first gentleman, right. um, you know, watching all of that uh, play out as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Biden agenda for women. If you, you know, we're on the campaign website, I think that that part of the website had like 30 pages of you know proposals and positioning on um, you know his agenda for women, quote unquote. What do you see um, in there uh, that would give us a sense of maybe what the next four years are going to be like for women and girls under this administration, and the kind of things that he is going to uh, be prioritizing in that realm? I mean, I think for now, um, as we talked about before, because COVID is yeah. just so front and center and there just is not um a bigger sort of crisis that the administration is tackling mm -hmm. with you know such urgency i think that is where we are seeing sort of the first clear signs of how they plan on um really you know tackling and separating out um the ways in which uh a crisis like this one can can affect women differently than men and and you know i'm stating something that is factual and is backed up by data it's obviously unfortunate but like the reality is that throughout the pandemic we have seen uh this virus and the economic crisis that has come with the virus affect women uh in worse ways than men you know mm -hmm. whether it's because you know women uh just naturally have a bigger share of sort of domestic responsibilities or you know they are not able to continue working in the middle of uh, this pandemic because they have to be the ones to stay at home and take care of their uh, kids uh, we are just seeing how sort of devastating this um virus has been for everyone but for for women especially and uh people of color those problems and issues have been exacerbated and so i think that is why you know even before inauguration we saw the biden team really drawing that distinction and mm -hmm really making the promise, right, to say, we know that there are different groups of people being affected in different ways. And, you know, we want to make a concerted effort to make sure that our, you know, policy ideas and policy proposals take that into account. I mean, the, the number of times that you hear um, the new administration when they're talking about COVID and COVID relief and everything that they're going to do, you know, use the word equity. Uh, that right. has been such a core uh, sort of theme for them, making sure in everything that we do, we take into account the fact that different people have been affected differently and uh, women are, are obviously not an exception. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of some of these, the interest groups that are kind of out there, you know, with their policy agenda, <clears throat> There was a full page ad in the New York Times today from Girls Who Code, um, signed on by you know several female celebrities and business leaders and activists, asking Biden to come up with a pandemic plan to act to pay mothers for the work that they do, um, called the Marshall Plan for Moms. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about that idea? Um, 
you know, because as you mentioned, you know, so much of um, what is going on now in terms of women in the workforce and the um, really outsized role that so many mothers are playing in terms of, um, you know, educating their children and homeschooling um, and doing everything else that moms do, right? It's, yeah. it's gotten, um, exacerbated by this. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> those are issues I've been thinking about more and more as uh, uh, I approach the point of becoming a first time mom in a matter of in weeks. In a few weeks. <laughs> in a few weeks. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I just speaking personally, like when I when I think about this, like I I know and I'm you know fully aware that like I fall in the group of women who are the luckiest of the luckiest, right? I have um, you know the ability to keep my job and a newsroom and a workplace and bosses who are you know very supportive of the fact that I'm I'm about to go on. Uh, maternity leave, which by the way, is going to be fully paid and I will have a number of months that I can take off um, while I transition into being a mom and taking care of a newborn. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a spouse who is also going to be able to take that kind of time off and, uh, you know, pay time off. And the reality is that that is just not the average experience for so many moms and uh, so many women. And, you know, I don't think it's a political statement in any way to say there are certain things that, you know, clearly would uh, be beneficial for uh, parents, families, especially new moms uh, to have uh, benefits for them to have access to, um, you know, parental paid time off. Um, there are certain things like that that I think, you know, should be just more accessible and should be universal because it is just so difficult for you know people to juggle uh parenthood and having a family and everything that that entails with being able to you know work and make sure that you're able to provide properly for your family um so all of that to say uh, you know i i would be very surprised if these issues were not um, you know, front and center for the Biden administration. I don't know how uh, quickly uh, that will happen, um, given that, again, the priority for them right now is so much, you know, COVID focused and economic relief um, that is related to COVID. But that's not to say that these issues that we are talking about uh, are not um, related to COVID as well. In fact, they are, you know, very much compounded by the virus. Um, and the experience that we all have had over the last year. Yeah, and and obviously this is sort of with a political lens too, but, you know, and especially during the campaign, I'm curious your, on just your reflections on this, from having covered the campaign, this outreach to women voters being so important um, to that kind of Biden constituency, um, you know, Black women especially, right? Um, what did you see, you know, during the campaign uh, in terms of um, the outreach that the campaign did toward women? And I assume that, you know, they're going to have to double down on some of that, um, you know, because they're, you know, always thinking ahead to the next election, right? Yeah, and and I think the um, really interesting thing that we saw. <clears throat> in the 2020 cycle, uh, uh -huh. obviously, the, obviously the Biden campaign did a ton of outreach um, specifically to women. And a part of their uh, strategy was recognizing that particularly during the Trump years, the demographics of, um, you know, who made up the Democratic Party versus the GOP, like really shifted. And so much of that had to do with women, right? Women mm -hmm. and um, particularly uh, college educated women, you know, we talk about suburban women all the time on cable right. TV, but it, but it really was true that uh, this was sort of the core group that Democrats seized on because they saw that they were, uh, you know, leaving increasingly the Republican party, the traditional Republican party as we have known it. And mm -hmm. so, I think the outreach that the Biden campaign did to women uh, sort of took that into account and sort of uh, tried to factor in, 
you know, if if we need to do, you know, X percent uh, better in X, Y and Z states compared to Hillary Clinton, like wh who are the women who traditionally have voted Republican or, you know, have been on the fence before, but are, you know, sort of repulsed by what the what the GOP stands for, particularly under the Trump years? Like, what right. are the different ways in which we can win them over? Because we know for a fact that they are currently on the fence or we can certainly try to win them over. Yeah, um, I'm gonna take a couple questions and I just was skimming through and there's a few uh, points that I wanted to make sure to get to as well. And um, this is an example of that. Um, talking about media coverage of um, female politicians, this is a good question um, from Isabel. And she says, um, from your perspective as a political correspondent, do you feel like media coverage of women politicians and leaders is improving fast enough and what kind of steps are media outlets doing that's uh, taking to avoid kind of gendered stereotypes when covering women, uh, which is obviously a major hurdle for women uh, running for office and holding other leadership positions? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it's genuinely tough and I do think it's a work in progress. I think any mm -hmm. other answer would uh, not be um, uh, sort of honest, you know, it's a dynamic that we uh, grapple with a lot um, as reporters, and I think in newsrooms. And you know, if we were to just go back to Kamala Harris as an example, we cover her, um, you know, in in different contexts. Obviously, in the 2020 context and Biden's decision to choose her, mm -hmm. so much of it um, was about sort of the historic nature of this first, right? first right. woman um, vice president, first woman uh, vice president who was also uh, black, who was also of South Asian descent. And I think and I think rightfully so. I'm not saying that it is a mistake to not fully sort of recognize that and give that the proper due because it, it really was history in the making. Um, but I do think there has to be sort of this constant um, you know, reassessment and reflection about, are we also making sure that we are covering this person who is the vice president uh, for everything uh, that she is, that isn't about, you know, what makes her a barrier breaking uh, vice president. But I think that, you know, some of that is on the Biden administration and, and Harris herself and, um, what actually she is doing day to day, right? Like right. on a day when, you know, she is uh, helping to swear in, you know, Janet Yellen, who is also making history as the first female treasury secretary, we're going to cover that and make sure that our viewers know this is why this moment and this uh, visual is so significant. Um, there are a lot of sort of firsts that are happening here. Right. But, uh, in addition to that, you know, there are going to be days, especially as we get, you know, further into the administration where we're going to have to figure out. So like putting all of that aside, again, not to not to suggest that it isn't important, but putting all of that aside, like what is she accomplishing or what is she doing? What are the actions she's taking as a vice president? And also, you know, taking sort of a beat to ask ourselves if she were a, a white male vice president, are there ways in which we would be covering her differently or, you know, mm -hmm. paying attention to her mm -hmm. in sort of different ways? So so I do think it is a juggling act. Um, mm -hmm. I do think it's going to take a while for us to get. To yeah, I mean, there's sensitivities on both sides of that. Right. Yeah, definitely. And we and we saw it throughout the primaries, too. We were talking about the VP selection uh, process and, you know, the um, sort of concerns that some you know women especially voiced about uh whether uh they agreed with the decision on you know by biden to sort of early on preemptively promise that he was right. going to choose a woman so yeah which I mean, led it, to you know a an array of women sort of being floated and then all of them being picked apart uh yeah. bit by bit too throughout right. the process which right. i didn't necessarily think was helpful um either. But I mean, do you see that? Um, I guess, you know, we, we are more and more aware of some of this that goes on in the media now. And I, I think people are more in tune to kind of, you know, if you see something, say something mentality, so that there are sort of these outside checks on 
you know, some of the, you know, more gendered uh, stereotyping kind of reporting that obviously we've seen uh, in times past. Mm -hmm. um, do you notice that as much as, um, you know, we're just more attuned to kind of calling that out when something happens? Um, I, I mean, I do think because um, there, you know, is more sensitivity around it, yeah. as you said. Yeah. Um, and I also think that uh, social media plays a huge yeah. role in this. Um, when there's some kind of, you know, controversy or something in the headlines that is rubbing women the wrong way, I do think there's, uh, you know, there is now this way for women to like amplify each other's voices and make sure that there is you know, a big forum in which uh, these conversations are being had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about even the the whole controversy with Kamala Harris being on the Vogue cover and, right. you know, whether, you know, if he had been a, a male uh, VP, would they have chosen a photo that was, that looked, you know, that casual and was this, you know, a certain kind of disrespect that only a woman could have gotten um, I think all of that becomes all the more heated and ends up getting, you know, that much more attention because people are on on Twitter replying, mm -hmm. you know, to each other and retweeting each other's tweets. So, yeah, I think it's it's the fact that we are in the year 2021 and all of those things are possible that we um, that it seems like and I think it's true that women are more engaged than ever before in discussing and wanting to discuss these issues. Yeah. Um, let's see, here's a good question from um, Caitlin. Um, she says, congrats on your new role, MJ. Um, how do you see former presidential candidates like Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren fitting into the Biden administration? Had the Dems captured a larger Senate majority, do you think they would have had larger roles in or cabinet positions? I guess being sensitive to the fact that you can't take too many people out of the Senate, put them in the administration and risk losing, um, you know, the numbers in the Senate. Right. Yeah, um, I, I do. I do think the answer to that question is yes. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not saying that there's like some specific cabinet role that uh, Amy Klobuchar surely, you know, would have gotten uh, were right. it not for the makeup of the Senate. Same with Elizabeth Warren. But I do think that uh, it would have been a lot easier and even possible for the Biden folks to consider um, members of the Senate to serve in his government um, had it not been for this, you know, they didn't even know until very recently um, what exactly the makeup of the Senate would be. So it just kind of became, um, uh, you know, not, not even something they could consider seriously. Uh, yeah. to take anybody out of the Senate, to, you know, take a Democrat out of the Senate to uh, serve in his administration. You know, Deb Holland is an example of somebody. Obviously, uh, she uh, is a member of the House. Dynamics there are a little different in that they have a you know, Democrats have a slim majority in the House, but um, it's nothing like uh, what we uh, the dynamics in the right. Senate in terms of the division. And I thought it was a very key sort of moment for her and her ultimately being chosen to be interior secretary when uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, you know, publicly said in the in the form of this, I think it was a memo or a letter where she said, you know, she she fully would support uh, if Biden were to choose Holland. You know, that was that was a real endorsement from her. Right. And then sort of an unusual move. And I thought mm -hmm. kind of telling uh, when that became public, it just seemed like, OK, she is making it clear to everybody. If you need to take, you know, this one, uh, you know, person in my party out of the House, I will allow it and it will be OK. Um, but right. I think that the dynamics in the Senate were it, it was just too difficult for Democrats yeah. to mess with that. And then what about their their own political future, um, you know, beyond, you know, potential cabinet job in the future? I mean, let's say that um, just for the sake of discussion, Biden doesn't run again in 2024. Um, could we see, you know, some of these other women actually challenging uh, Vice President Harris uh, for the nomination? Um, <laughs> just to play out that part of the game, right? <laughs> It's like so painful to be already talking about 2024. It's never too early. 
No, I think it just, it really, really depends on uh, what, uh, you know, whether Biden runs in 2024, but you're talking about yeah. a scenario where he doesn't. Yeah. Um, in the scenario where he doesn't, I think it really, really depends on uh, whether Kamala Harris runs and also just what kind of pres uh, vice president uh, she has um, made herself to be in the next, right. you know, two, three years. We know that the uh, that story, the 2024 uh, cycle is going to start in probably two years, though, Betsy, you're, <laughs> you're starting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a bit earlier. Um, but I but I truly do think that, um, you know, if, if she is uh, in a position to launch her campaign, you know, being able to say, you know, look at my administration and everything that it has accomplished and everything that I have accomplished alongside uh, President Biden. We have, you know, ended the COVID pandemic. We were in the middle of an economic crisis and now things are, you know, back on track and people are, you know, feeling um, a lot better about just sort of the state of the country and, you know, the state of the economy for our families. Um, if, the, if she's even able to say those two things with confidence and right. the administration is largely viewed as a, a success, then yeah, I think she is probably going to have um, a, an incredible platform to uh, run on in addition to the fact that she is already the sitting vice president. And what about the Republican side? Caitlin had a question about that. Um, any targeted front runners for 2024? Um, I mean, could we see a Nikki Haley running? Uh, who else is out there um, on the Republican yeah. side? I mean, I think on the Republican side too, um, it so, everything so depends on what happens with Donald Trump and what he right. decides to do. I'm not right. making any predictions about like, I, I do not think it is a foregone conclusion that he will definitely run in 2024. I think there are a lot of reasons why actually he ultimately uh, will not, including, you know, legal troubles, financial troubles that are clearly, you know, very much on the horizon for him. I do think that uh, we can easily see a scenario uh, based on what we know about Donald Trump, where he sort of floats the idea and dangles the possibility of running for a really long time, making things really complicated for, you know, any other Republican with even the smallest, uh, you know, aspiration to potentially consider running uh, for president in 2024. Like they are all going to be watching him for cues on what he is going to do. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, sort of whether you are able to get support from him and whether um, for some of these candidates, it's important for them to feel like, uh, you know, they are sort of tapping into the base that is Donald Trump's base. Like that is going to be a huge factor too. And I just think it is uh, too early to know how the, you know, we're not even into the second uh, Donald Trump impeachment trial yet, right? We don't right. know how that's going to shake out. Right. Though, you know, right now it does seem like it's going to be uh, difficult for Democrats to secure a conviction. But like, again, like we truly don't know. And I think so much of how 2024 shakes out on the Republican side will um, have to do with what happens with Donald Trump. But yeah, I do think in terms of women Republican candidates, Nikki Haley is probably the one that uh, whose name comes up the most. Well, and, and we've seen Trump now even just engaging in, already in, in 2022 um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, um, you know, former White House press secretary, of course, announced her bid the other day to run for governor, no surprise, of Arkansas, um, you know, with a nice uh, endorsement from President Trump um, along the way. Right. right. What do you think about um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders moving from uh, the press secretary job into uh, the governor's mansion in uh in Arkansas, of course, you know, a position that her dad obviously held um, for many years. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's so um, <laughs> she's such a fascinating example of uh, what it can mean to be a sort of a successful uh, Republican candidate in mm -hmm. the age of Trump. I mean, she is somebody who has uh, never run for office. She has not been an elected official. 
has not had you know executive experience. She, uh, her, the Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, brand is the Donald Trump brand, right? right. She uh, is known as having been his spokesperson, his defender, sort of the face of the White yeah, House. Yeah, literally the face of the White literally House. Literally the Right, literally yeah. the face of the White House. And as soon as she made the announcement, she got the coveted uh, Trump endorsement. And, you know, this is not a race that I am uh, going to pretend I followed closely, but um, it does seem like at least for now, she is going to emerge the front runner in whatever, you know, primary race there ends up uh, being in the state. I mean, that's like pretty, pretty amazing that, because you were the person who, you know, worked for Trump and, you know, you were on national television defending, uh, you know, everything that the president was doing and many things that a lot of people thought, you know, should not be defensible. Mm -hmm. Here you have now able to launch a credible uh, campaign for to be governor of a state like that's that's pretty amazing. Right. But she was one of the few people that left on a high note, as we recall. I mean, she was not fired over Twitter, like she right. left, you know, with the blessing, right, of of that Trump political machine. And so, right. you know, no surprise that she's going to try to capitalize um, on that. Let's see, we have a, a question from uh, Lynn Olson, a colleague of ours. Um, she says, I think Samantha Power is the first heavy hitter to ever head USAID. Uh, it's always been sort of a backwater. I'm expecting a higher profile and more impact on the world because of her. Um, what do you think? Um, I mean, I would basically agree with that, but I will yeah. not pretend to uh, know a lot about sort of the dynamics of that specific role. So um, let's see, a couple other questions here. Um, let's see, we talked about Kamala. Um, this is another question on um, the media. Um, Tyler is asking, um, how do you hope trust in the news media is back? after years of people believing it to be fake news if it doesn't align with their views. So yeah, we talked about sort of the fake news era from the White House podium maybe turning the page, but how do we, how does the media restore confidence um, after the last four years of being um, targeted as fake news uh, from the Trump White House? Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like I get asked this question a lot and, uh -huh. um, I always give the same answer and I just don't know how satisfying people find it. And it, it genuinely honestly is to just keep doing our jobs the best that we can. Um, I just don't think there was anything that uh, reporters and newsrooms could have done differently um, when we were, you know, under sort of constant attack for being fake news. And again, those attacks coming directly from the president of the United States. I think we, um, you know, had to find uh, uh, specific ways of covering uh, the Trump administration and the Trump mm -hmm. years because we grappled on a daily basis with um, the lines just being so blurred between what was uh, truthful and what was not uh, coming from the president himself and and those around him. Um, but like I I am really proud of the newsroom that I work in and especially my you know colleagues at the White House who covered um, the former administration day in and day out. And I think the most important thing that we uh, could have done, and I think uh, my colleagues tried to do every single day that they were covering the administration, was just to be really straight and direct every time they went on air or every time they wrote a story for CNN.com, which is just mm -hmm. to say, you know, this is what happened today, this is what President Trump said today, and here's what is wrong or correct or problematic um, about all of the above. And I just think we're, we have to continue doing that um, with the new administration. Um, but I think that was sort of always the plan, right? It's not as though there's some new, you know, there's a there's an adjustment to how we are going to do journalism or report on the new administration, you know, simply because the last four years were sort of uniquely, uh, uniquely challenging. 
Um, one more media question for you. Um, this is from Alex, um, who asked, please comment on the status of women in the media. Um, it still feels very male dominated uh, in many ways. What are your thoughts on women in front of the camera and then also obviously behind the scenes and some of the executive roles um, as well? Um, I guess I would just say, you know, I know there's always uh, progress that can be made, but I, mm -hmm. I actually um, happen to disagree with the um, assessment that, at least just from my vantage point, uh, that uh, media tends to be uh, heavily male dominated. I think there are parts of media uh, certainly that are more male dominated, but if I'm, if I'm speaking from just my own experience of having covered mm -hmm. Um, the campaign and now obviously uh, the White House. I mean, even going back to 2016, when I covered um, the Hillary Clinton campaign, the you look around the, the press plan and like there were, I think, more women than there were men. Um, I think the same could be said of my experience covering Elizabeth Warren's campaign. Um, and I think that there were uh, plenty of women covering the Biden campaign as well. Um, you know, if you look at the, the White House press briefing, uh, briefings that have happened uh, so far in the first week and see the, you know, people who are in the room, the reporters who are in the room, like there are plenty of women. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, when you are, uh, you know, taking into account television news specifically, it's obviously a very, uh, you know, visual and you see uh, right away, well, you know, how many female reporters versus male, um, just speaking for, you know, CNN and our newsroom, like, I think we have um, great diversity in terms of, uh, you know, gender. I think that we can always do a better job. And I don't think any of my, you know, bosses would say anything uh, differently. Yeah. Um, before we go, I want to let everybody know about a couple of, um, other programs we have coming up for our Women in Wednesdays. Um, next Wednesday, we invite you to join us um, for what I think will be a fun discussion with uh, um, newly elected member Kathy Manning uh, of North Carolina and her daughter, uh, Jenny Kaplan, who has a terrific podcast um, on Wonder Media Network called Women Belong in the House, um, which she started uh, when her mom ran, I believe, for Congress uh, the first go around in 2018. So it'll be fun uh, to hear from the two of them on uh, next Wednesday. And then we have a few other upcoming um, dates for you. Um, we have, let's see, um, coming up, uh, our first male Women on Wednesdays guest, uh, Dan Moraine, who has uh, just written a new book uh, on Kamala Harris called Kamala's Way. Um, on February 24th, we have um, him coming. And then for International Women's Day, we have a great program um, with Gail Zemak Laman, who has just written a new book. Uh, it's not even out yet, uh, called The Daughters of Kabani. It's already been um, optioned to make into a um, television series by Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton's new production company. Um, and that um, we will discuss on uh, March 3rd. So we invite you. Uh, to join us for both of those uh, three, those three events and follow uh, our newsletter. And we will have, um, of course, um, more information, registration information there. Um, but MJ, thank you for being with us tonight. We really appreciate all of your insights and a look behind the scenes, uh, behind the curtain, if you will, on the Biden administration. And um, we will love to have you back. Um, as we um, kind of get into some of the more media aspects of, um, of what the Biden administration is doing, um, you know, over the next few months. So thank no, you. Thank you for having me. This was great. And thank you all for tuning in and for the great questions too. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the great questions. And we hope to see everybody next week. Good night.